right, so thank you guys for coming to the first ever Eigen Spectrum uh, speaker series talk. Hopefully this is the first of a fruitful, fruitful line of them. Uh, today we have Dr. Robert Carter, uh, who actually, working on tribology, which is the study of friction, received his PhD here in uh, 1997. 1997. Okay. Um, and from there, he went out to a postdoc and then to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, unfortunately, he experienced some different kinds of friction there and uh, <laughs> moved on recently to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where he still is and still working on trichology. But we are very excited to hear about his experiences as an, a scientist out in academia. And thank you, Dr. Dr. Carter, for coming. Thank you very much. Dr. of the New York Philharmonic and gay 
man who incredibly uh, creative. And there's this uh, uh, joke about um, uh, two uh, elderly women, two gray-haired women, who are out at a concert, and Leonard Bernstein is conducting, and it's a fabulous you know, performance. And um, concert ends, and everybody stands up with a rousing standing ovation. Uh, but one of the, these two women, she, she stays seated down with the scowl on her face, her, her you know, arms folded. And her friend says, you know, Edith, why, why, aren't, you, why aren't you applauding? It was a wonderful concert. And Edith says, well, Martha, I hear he's a homosexual. Martha says, is there anything Lenny can <laughs> so there is there isn't anything that you can do. Okay. Um, and the thing I want uh, that I had to tell myself and be told by others that okay, you might think that um, uh, achieving whatever your goal is, whether you want to be a scientist in industry uh, or in academia or national lab or just you want to discover and do great things in your research in graduate school and beyond. Um, you are, you, you're, you're, the fact that you're here at Berkeley, you're, you're, you already have 99% of the potential, okay? You probably have 100% of the potential um, to do what you want to do. And the reason why um, I think academia in particular is a wonderful career path uh, is because you do, for the most part, get to be your own boss. And you do have to write proposals and justify what you do and write reports and teach and do a good job of it and convince people to get to tenure. But if you can do that, then you have this tremendous uh, freedom of you know, academic freedom, which, which is an incredible thing. Um, so I'll just tell you a couple of stories through, through my education. So I, I was, I'm Canadian. I was born in Winnipeg, which is a very cold, remote, lonely place. Um, and then I, but, Fortunately for me, my family moved to Toronto, the suburbs of Toronto, and I mostly grew up there. I went to uh, Port Credit Secondary School in the suburb of Mississauga. This is their this is their logo, and this is their Latin motto: "Lux nunquam desi," which says, uh, "May the light never fail." And um, you know, as I was putting this talk to you, I just I thought for the fun of it to show where I'd been, I would look up these logos, and I started realizing that you know these that this particular motto was was kind of an appropriate one for me because so at the time I was in high school from like you know the '80s, so this was a time when the AIDS crisis emerged. It was a time when both in the U.S. and Canada and in most other countries, except for a handful. There were no legal protections for gays and lesbians, um, let alone transgender people. And um, gay bashings were a, a, a routine uh, event. Uh, raids on gay bars by police was still uh, something that would happen. Raids on a, a gay bathhouse where people were beaten uh, and arrested uh, for no good reason was something that occurred while I was in high school. So there was a tremendous amount of, of homophobia. And not that there still isn't much today that needs to be, and much bigotry today that needs to be dealt with. But it was a pretty frightening time. You know, Ronald Reagan was, was president of the US. He was someone who didn't even say the word gay or, or, or address the AIDS crisis until many years after it had started. Um, so, so, you know, I was very closeted and I knew I was gay. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't even an option to even for me considered coming up to anybody, um, not even my closest friends, at least. It didn't seem like, in my mind, it wasn't an option. When I look back, I realize it probably was. There were other, certainly there were other people who were gay, and there were other people who actually probably were, would have been open-minded enough, but I was absolutely uh, frightened to do it. And there were times that um, I, you know, did not see any light and, and, and you know, pondered uh, whether it was worth going on. I felt so uh, alone, even though I had, I was sort of a geeky on the, I was on the, I was in a total outcast, I was on the geeky side of things, and, you know, we were part of that, that, that uh, set of the people that 
got good grades but didn't know how to look or act or, or dress cool. So, um, so for me though, there was a benefit, okay? And the benefit was that um, to kind of um, make up, in a sense, for, for being gay, for being on the more, you know, the not cool side of the school, and to shelter myself from potential criticism was that I just threw myself into my studies. So I, I you know, I loved uh, and was good at, at math and physics and, and, and most, most subjects, so I, I worked extra hard um, uh, at school um, because uh, it was a way to, it, you know, divert attention and, and to excel and be good at something. I certainly didn't feel good at being myself. Um, and so, um, so there was that, and then there was the fact that, you know, I love math and physics uh, as well. Um, because, you know, you could use it to solve problems. And so I thought, well, here, here's some way I can solve, so I don't, I can't solve being gay, but at least I can solve this equation. <laughs> so uh, you know, there was something. Um, and uh, I inherited this gene from my mother, who was a type A. She was a middle child, but um, was extremely competitive to try to say that. So somehow I, I had that in me. So, so I just, yeah, worked hard, got, got good grades. I was very fortunate, great, great teachers. And so I was able to make it into the University of Toronto, um, where uh, I um, did my bachelor's degree. And the motto, so there's the Canadian beaver, right? There's the queen, the big ones, the queen, the royal crown, and the books you read. And, and then the <laughs> Ardor Evo was their motto. Um, does, anybody make, does anybody ever take Latin? Anybody know what that says? Oh, really? Do you know, do you know what it says? So, Okay, so it stands as a tree through the ages. That's their, their motto. And it is a very old university. It dates back to the early 1800s. Um, and so I, so, um, so, you know, it's a long tradition. Um, beautiful campus. If you're ever in Toronto, definitely check it out. Um, I, so I majored in physics. And this is where things started to get a little better. So physics, I feel, kind of saved my life because um, I didn't meet any other gay students in the physics program, but everybody was a total outcast and different and strange. And so this helped. So I didn't feel different. I actually feel, well, I'm actually kind of more normal for these people. Um, so um, so I, I uh, found some, became friends with some people, became roommates. Actually, it was a couple. They were both uh, a guy and a girl who were both um, in the physics majors. And as we were about to move in uh, to share an apartment together, I felt like I. I got up the courage to finally come out with somebody because I felt my rationalization was not that I wanted to come out for myself, but that I owed it to them to let them know I was gay in case there was a, you know, uh, in case they'd be upset by it. And so I had to tell them, right? That's how I rationalized it. Instead of doing it as just, I just want to be honest, or I just want to do it for myself. And when I told them, you know, I thought I was, you know, going to uh, pass out. I felt so so much anxiety about it. And yet they said, oh, oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's okay with us. And it just blew me away. Um, and uh, because I had only ever uh, anticipated uh, rejection at that point. So this was 1987, I guess, 1987. So it was still a rather, you know, a, a fairly dark time um, relative so then I, you know, I majored in physics. I worked as an undergraduate in a research lab, and I, I got the bug for doing research. And I, and I was very fortunate to have excellent, again, amazing professors who mentored me and guided me um, and suggested you, know, you, you should think about doing a PhD. Research is wonderful. And you should think about going to the US, because well, the quality of work in Canada is still excellent. You know, the vigor and the, the, the facilities and the people that you'll find in US research institutions is just unrivaled. So I applied to a whole bunch of places, um, including Berkeley. This was my first choice, and I was warned. I still remember calling um, the, the program. This is before the days of email. Uh, and calling the program to ask what the admission statistics were like. And this, this woman answered on the other point. She had this real strong California kind of voice, which for me as a kid, maybe to many of you it didn't sound, doesn't sound like anything, but to me I thought, who is this? She sounds like a surfer chick. <laughs> and it was Anne Takazawa. <laughs> Students, but you can try and you 
she was kind and luck, and she was very kind, and, and so I applied when I, when I got the letter that I had been admitted, I just jumped for joy, and um, so I came here, and uh, um, I don't have, I don't, so, so the, the Latin motto is fiat lux, let there be light. I, I haven't, I couldn't find a version on the web that has that, but the old Mott's insignia must have said it in Latin, but anyways. So let there be light. So I certainly felt coming to Berkeley, there was, I'd seen the light and gotten in. And, you know, after coming up to these friends, I came up to lots of people in Toronto, and I, and I taught at a vibrant gay community. Um, Queer Nation had emerged, and ACT UP had emerged, and there was a new kind of strength in the voice of the LGBT communities. Um, and so then I, you know, hey, now I get to live next to San Francisco. This is great. Um, so, um, so I came here, this was 1992, uh, I met Steve, I met these other just very um, open, uh, humorous, wonderful, bright, engaging, brilliant people. Um, again, started off thinking I think they made a mistake uh, letting me in here, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, and I, you know, there's this whole process you go through the qualifying exams and, and taking, do, do they still make, uh, do they still make you take E&M at 8 in the morning? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, we Jack, we'll still do Jack's 8 in the morning. Okay. Yeah. It's a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage. And we all went through that together and we all bonded over it. Um, so, um, you know, so I continued to, I you would know, come out to my classmates. But I still felt, you know, so I, I felt comfortable being out to my peers, um, and, it, and it all went very positively. I mean, I don't, I never, I, there was not a single negative reaction to, to my face. Um, and frankly, I didn't sense um, anything even under, you know, any undercurrents either. Frankly, people were just, uh, people who chose to come to Berkeley, you know, knew that this is a place where there's uh, something for everybody in the first place. So, so, but I didn't really come out to, uh, I felt very hesitant coming out to the people above me. I finally came out to my research advisor um, through uh, sort of, kind of by accident. How was it? I was, I was about, it was the gay pride, it was gay pride weekend and I was telling a colleague about it. I'm in the middle of telling a colleague about how I was about to go, she asked me if I was going to pray, postdoc, I was with it. And my advisor walks in on the middle of this conversation I thought, well, I could stop talking or not. So we just kept we just kept talking about, yeah, so I'll be going there on Sunday, blah, blah, blah. And then I, okay, I gotta go by, and I left. And the postdoc told me afterwards, what, Ron's gay? <laughs> he went, nobody tells me anything. <laughs> so he was upset that to be the last one to find out. <laughs> um, so, so, that, so, so, that, so that was fun. So then I finished. You know, as I was finishing up my PhD, I, I, I interviewed for a postdoctoral position um, uh, at, at uh, another, so Mikhail Salmeron is up on the hill about the L. Um, so, so I found out another DOE opportunity, so I interviewed for a position at Sandia National Labs. Um, all right, so Sandia doesn't have a Latin motto that I can quote for you, but being a national security, well, yeah, they wouldn't want to do it in Latin, right? Because being a national security lab, uh, you know, they wouldn't want to use anything other than good old American English. Um, and they do have um, uh, a motto, which is exceptional service in the national interest. Um, which sounds kind of uh, a little bland, but actually that's what Harry S. Truman wrote when he argued for the founding. Uh, he wrote to the head of the Department of Energy and said, you need to start this lab as an engineering support lab uh, for Los Alamos um, to provide this exceptional service in the national interest. So I went for this interview, and I, um, you know, I got the offer. It was actually a really kind of tough interview. They asked me tough questions, but it went okay. Um, I was in the office of one of the people who was interviewing me, and and he said to me, "So uh, you live in Berkeley?" I said, "Yes." Well, yeah. And this is you know, this is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, right? This isn't the Sandia here in California. There's two Sandia labs. This is the one based in, in Albuquerque. And this guy says to me, yeah, I, uh, I, I like to go to San Francisco. I, I have friends in San Francisco, and I go there, and I play. 
<laughs> I said, okay, good for you. <laughs> it was a very strange kind of covert way that he was trying to come out to me. And um, although it came out awkwardly, after I started there, this person, you know, we became friends. It turned out it was a bit awkward, but he, he actually was a very nice person. But at Sandy Net Lab, Labs, they do background checks. You, you, um, depending on which part of the lab you work in, you have to submit to a background check, and they would ask people about their sexual orientation at that time. They don't do that anymore. But they thought that if you were gay, you could be blackmailed, right? Um, the irony being, well, the only reason that you're, you might be blackmailable as gay would be if you're closeted and you want to protect yourself, right? So it's coming out <laughs> against that, <laughs> but asking people in a security, you know, question, a uh, security uh, examination, if, they might be gay is going the, the wrong way. So, um, um, and he told me a few other interesting things, which was that apparently um, uh, a controversy erupted when they were discussing whether to hire me as a postdoc in the department, because, uh, you know, I had both ears pierced, and somebody objected to that, and actually said, this guy's got pierced ears, and actually brought this up in a discussion of employing me as a postdoc. And, and this guy pushed back and said, oh, I, think that's the, well, I think that's refreshing. I think there's too many stuffed shirts around here. <laughs> I also got well, uh, some, some negative feedback. So I, I had gone without wearing a tie. Uh, and they thought this was, I was a little too informal. For, and, and actually, they were right. Like, you should wear a tie when you interview. You should wear a tie when you give a quote by him. You should wear a tie when you talk to the LGBT student. <laughs> <laughs> Always dress for success. Um, you know, Sandia Labs at that time didn't have any domestic partner benefits. While I was there, there was a move to bring them in, and this Christian, conservative Christian group. Uh, so someone put up flyers, sort of arguing in favor of, you know, lob, you know lobbying Sandia for domestic partner benefits, uh, non-discrimination statement. And then this Christian right group formed to oppose that, and they put up flyers, and so there's this war of the flyers. And you think about, that just wouldn't happen today. And in fact, Sandy National Labs now does offer uh, same-sex domestic partner benefits. They, 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 there's, um, uh, they have, um, they have anti-discrimination policy. Um, you know, so, so it was a great place scientifically as a postdoc. I mean, I really enjoyed my time there, and I was out to all of my my colleagues uh, there. But, um, but it, there was still this undercurrent. You know, if you if you're a little too out, you know. These, there was this group that wanted their presence known that they didn't think you were, you belong. Um, I, I then, in, in 2000, I went to the, the University of Wisconsin at Madison to uh, start my faculty position. Uh, I, I got a, a position there in, in engineering physics, so my research had been sort of of applied nature, so they brought me in. Um, Newman, Newman, does anybody know what that means? Being so 
positive with me on an interview. He was being incredibly, you know, uh, forward, almost like, I want to convince you why you should come to Wisconsin. I said, Are you married? He says. And I sort of froze. I wasn't expecting anybody to ask me if I was married. Um, and so I just said no, which felt awful because I did have a partner and we had um, been look, started to live together. Um, and, uh, but he had to just be kind of erased from the discussion. Um, it was illegal for him to ask me that question. You can't ask someone's family status, but people do. And it happens all the time. And so I, I, I said no. Um, I remember another incident um, a couple years after I started at Wisconsin. Um, I was at a workshop, a scientific workshop, and we were sitting at dinner. I was sitting next to this American who used to work for uh, a research division of a large company, and then he moved to Singapore. And so he was sitting on one side of me. Sitting on the other side of me was a woman, a researcher uh, from the university who I knew and who I had found out was a lesbian. So we knew, we knew about each other. So her and I are sitting there, and this guy, this kind of older American guy who was living in Singapore, and I said, oh, how do you like, you moved to Singapore, how do you like Singapore? And he looks at me with my female friend right next to me, he goes, do you like girls in shorts? Do you like girls in tight shorts, he says. And I was, again, stunned and didn't know what to say. And my friend Judith just jumps and says, Rob's too busy for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, that kind of just sexism and home, you know, heterosexism and this assumption that, hey, you know, hey, guy, young guy, you like girls in tight shorts in Singapore. Um, was, was, you know, disturbing. And I find that comments like that happen less often nowadays, but that was 2002, maybe 2003, not about that long ago. So it's out there, um, this kind of ignorant uh, thinking and inappropriate questioning. But that professor, the first one I mentioned, who asked me if I was married, he also asked me, uh, he also said, oh, do you go to church? There's a great Christian community here. Uh, and, you know, he's just not supposed to say that in He truly only meant, why he asked me if, he asked me if I was married because he wanted to know if I had kids, he wanted to tell me about the schools. He meant it well. Um, I became good friends with him. When I came out to him, he was um, quite surprised. I don't know why, I don't know, should be. But uh, isn't it obvious? <laughs> um, you just wish you don't have to keep coming out over and over again. But, um, um, but he became a very good friend, and he meant well by it, and um, and so people's intentions are not always the same as their uh, their actions. But you know, I, I was able to get tenure. I worked very hard. I went through periods of tremendous stress, and there was stress on my relationship. Um, uh, but I, I battled through, and you know, I, I had good publications, and I did a good job teaching, and I was able to get a, a good amount of funding. But I was frustrated because my partner, who was at that point in school, uh, was not eligible for um, health insurance benefits. So the state of Wisconsin refused. The university was trying to get the state's permission, but the state, you know, the governor, the legislature, they refused to allow uh, the university to grant domestic partner benefits uh, to health insurance and other benefits to same-sex domestic partners. And they had an explicit vote on this and, and uh, voted it down in the state legislature. And I was getting um, you know, uh, worked up about this. And there were not too many people willing to really speak up openly about it. So I wrote this letter to the editor. And, um, uh, or rather, I think I, I was interviewed by someone uh, for the local paper. And so this ended up being a front page story. Um, and I was worried what the repercussions of this would be. Um, and, uh, you know, well, how would my colleagues react to me being quite openly condemning the state of Wisconsin, which funds the university? Um, but in fact, people were, they joined me. They were outraged, too. Um, I had people were, uh, didn't understand, and this educated them just how much it, uh, a difference it made, that you, you know, the cost of your partner not having health insurance. Um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't, I had to do this because I just couldn't separate, you know, being out 
Um, I couldn't separate that from standing up for my own rights and for other people's rights. And I realized, actually, I'm a tenured professor at this point. You know, there are staff people who couldn't bother, who, would, who, who couldn't, speak, be, couldn't speak out. They, they would really, you know, be risking a backlash, you know. Um, I'm in a pretty secure position. I, 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 should, I should do this. Um, I got married in Canada in 2003, where marriage had been, gay marriage had been legalized there, so that involved me. And I had this wonderful partner, so, um, so, so that gave me the confidence to do this. And actually, in the, in the department, the department has this newsletter, so it's the Department of Engineering and Physics, so they have the worst newsletter title, the EP oh. department, episode, EP episode. <laughs> They, they, they did, the person who came up with that did not have the style of, you know, they, we need some, you know, queer eye for the straight guy. <laughs> Flash added to this, but anyways. Um, so, you know, they, 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 go, they went ahead and they uh, had a little news item about me where here they're highlighting something written, uh, written about me in Nature Materials, and then they mentioned, hey, he was written in this written up in this thing, you know, condemning the lack of benefits, and, you know, they quoted me, and, yeah, so that was my department sharing with all of their alums and potential donors, um, you know, about this. So, um, this battle kept going in the state of Wisconsin, and, um, you know, the excuses they made for not offering domestic partner benefits, oh, um, you know, it's going to cost too much. Well, it hardly cost anything. If you do the math, it cost less than the amount of funding that I myself had brought into the university, you know, in, uh, in, in a small number of years. So um, it's not expensive, um, but they just were not willing to, to do it at that time. And so, so I left, and as I left, um, I, I went public and was interviewed by the Associated Press about the fact that one of the reasons I was leaving, not the only reason, but one reason I was leaving um, was, was, was I couldn't continue to work in a place that was gonna treat me differently from my, my, my colleagues and, and with my partner not being uh, eligible for the same uh, benefits. Um, you know, I was uh, uh, very happy to move to the University of Pennsylvania because it was an excellent university, it was a move up, uh, it, 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 it had a lot of benefits. I wanted to live in one of them in a bigger, more diverse city. Uh, but, but, so I might have left anyhow, but this certainly pushed me up faster, and I certainly was not going to move to a university that didn't have same-sex defense department. <coughs> Penn was one of the first places that, that did. Um, so, um, and, and in fact, as I was, after I, shortly after I decided to leave, Wisconsin passed an anti-gay marriage amendment to their constitution. Uh, so that certainly sent them um, for that. So as I was on the way out, uh, you know, I did this interview, I thought I should, you know, get, get, get this issue out there, and, and they quoted even the chancellors using me. So I, I allowed myself to be kind of this you know, poster boy for the issue, um, which in some ways made me cringe. Uh, I didn't want to have to be out there like that, but I was the, sort of, it was, the situation was such that this was an opportunity to put the issue of same-sex domestic benefits out there. Um, so, the, so then I went to the institution. Um, so here's their logo. Ligas ne moribos ane. Very long, that's the longest one yet. And that one uh, was kind of, so kind of ironically, laws without morals are in vain. I really like that one. Um, so, you know, I went there, I was just so excited to be moving to this uh, great university and place and a fresh start, and it was, it was um, exciting. And I got a phone call from the student newspaper, the, Des the Daily Pennsylvania, and they had heard about me leaving Wisconsin, and they wanted to know, you know, about moving to Penn, and I told them, you know, please, you know, your story, make sure you state, you know, I'm, I'm not coming to Penn just because of the master part. I mean, I'm coming to Penn because it's a great university, great colleagues, great opportunities, big focus on nanoscience. You know, but I wouldn't come here if they didn't have domestic partner. That's the, that's the message. I tried to make it very clear to the student reporter. So then the issue of the newspaper comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Front page. 
People come to Penn for all sorts of reasons. Some cite top-notch research, top-notch academics. For others, it's the wrong location. For Rob Carving, it was health insurance for his husband. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so, so the other message is don't trust the student paper. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you work for the student paper. They, again, they meant well. They meant well. Um, and I did benefit from this because this got some attention that, like, just these a couple faculty just emailed me saying, "Hey, this is great," um, and uh, and saw you know these instant friends who came up, people who came up to me as, as allies. Um, so um, there there are several openly gay faculty at Penn. Um, for me, it's not been an issue there. An issue there. Um, you know, transgender benefits were an issue. Um, there was uh, work that had to be done convincing the university to cover the health insurance cost of, um, of uh, gender reassignment surgery. Um, they now do it, uh, but we had to, we had to push for that, we had to agitate for that. Um, there's a big push for diversity, uh, diversifying the faculty at Penn, and there's a debate that's sort of bubbling up, but has been made explicit. Is, 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 is an LGBT person, should that be considered someone from an underrepresented group? And should, should the resources, should, should this funding that's available for hiring minority faculty, or faculty from underrepresented groups, should that go to LGBT faculty as well? That's an issue that's ongoing to be. Um, I became department chair in, I guess, in my third year now. Um, so having the support of my colleagues to do that was really um, meaningful for me. And I think what allowed me to earn the trust of my colleagues was, was just that I, I generally worked hard, tried to get along with people, and um, uh, but was, was honest about who I was. And, and so my partner willingly comes, you know, happily comes, semi-happily comes to all the department events and parties. And, uh, like, he's more popular in the department than I am. So, um, so yeah, so Penn, in case you don't know, it was founded all the way back in 1749 by Benjamin Franklin, so a true innovator. And unlike what was unique about it, was there, there were other colleagues around, but it was not going to focus on clerk or education of the clergy, but as Franklin put it, Paris provides business and public service. Quite a bit smaller than Berkeley, it's 10,000 undergrads, 10,000 uh, grad students, about 700 faculty, engineering is about 100, actually more than this nowadays, six departments. And um, Ben Franklin, I'm sure you all know lots about him, but he, you know, he has so many amazing uh, quotes. But one of my favorite ones is this, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, you know, they're on the threshold of, of you know, a revolution. <laughs> we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we will, we will all hang separately. <laughs> and, um, you know, this student is worthy, that this uh, statement is worthy of, of taking to heart um, within just about any group or organization. Something. So I hope you all, you know, hang, hang together, or yeah, hang together, hang together <laughs> in the good way. Um, so I'll say a word about tribology. So that comes from the Greek word tribos, which means rubbing. And so my gay friends tease me endlessly about so I like study French and adhesion and lubrication. Um, so it makes for all sorts of great, you know, evening remarks. Um, you know, uh, if you weren't at my seminar, the quick advertising is, you know, there's lots of engineering successes in overcoming friction and wear, but we don't really have a good way of predicting friction uh, and wear between materials, so we're trying to study the nanoscale to learn, to learn something more about it. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, cons economic consequences, just economic consequences of it, and from one study, one to one and a half percent of industrial emissions gross national product is spent on energy that's wasted through friction, materials that wear because of friction. And you could save a lot of that from more efficiency, reduce loss of revenues from breakdowns, reduce lubricant costs. We all know how expensive those lubricants can be. Um, reduce maintenance and replacement costs. Um, so, so the Egyptians actually studied this. So this is from 1880 BC. And here is this gigantic. Egyptian chair professor. <laughs> <laughs> and here are 100, 
172 graduates here. <laughs> and here's this postdoc <laughs> who gets to ride along, and he can see what he's doing. He's got this jar, and he's pouring this liquid. And so they're dragging the sledge, uh, and the sled, and he is um, pouring something. And might, some people thought it was uh, pork fat, or the one <coughs> interpretation. Uh, other people said, no, it's just water. If you calculate the friction coefficient for water on, um, you know, I don't know what they would call a dragon. Maybe they were dragging across stone. Um, uh, and you calculate the weight of what this should be for this many people, it actually kind of all works out. The amount of force they're getting, this is how it works. Actually, if you go back from 1880 to 2400 BC, you can see the same thing. Here's the jar. Here's the liquid being poured out. So these are the world's, you know, oldest records of tribologists. And, um, but you know, in 2400 BC, the postdoc had to walk backwards um, on his feet. In 1880 BC, he got to ride along with the professor, so he got a promotion. And um, it's an upwardly mobile field. <laughs> um, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who um, uh, has all sorts of accomplishments, um, actually studied friction. So he wrote, friction produces double the amount of effort if the weight be doubled. So friction is proportional to the normal force, right? And the friction made by the same weight is the same. Uh, all of the contact may be of different breadths or lengths. So here he's got these blocks, and he's putting on the side, on the flat end, on the narrow end. Friction's the same. So friction's independent of the apparent area of contact. Hamilton in, in France was the one who wrote this down. And Coulomb came up with the difference between static and kinetic friction. So, so everybody, all sorts of people you've heard about have been thinking about, about friction for a while. So we like to study it at, at the nanoscale. So we use atomic force microscope probes to measure these things. And so when my friends try to tease me about the suggestive comments about, you know, you study friction and lubrications. Yeah, but I study it at the scale, so don't get too excited. Okay. <laughs> um, so you can do all sorts of cool things. You can see atomic lattices on surfaces, and you can image things in contact at small scales. And so, so there's all sorts of fun to be had. Um, Yeah, okay. So, um, all right, so, so that's, that's my area, and then you've all got your areas that you want to um, excel in. So why does it, does it matter? Uh, does it matter whether someone's gay or straight or open or closeted or an ally? Um, and I think it does matter a lot. Um, there needs to be more of us uh, in science and engineering. Uh, and, and there needs to be more of us for the good of science and engineering. It's not only the right thing to do for ourselves and for our community, um, uh, it's the right thing to do for science, uh, to come out and to be honest about who you are and to be open. Um, well, so, and let me explain why. Uh, we, you all, are already role models for younger people, and you will continue to be role models, whether you're uh, and, uh, LGBT or our ally. Um, and science and engineering in this country um, is threatened because funding is insufficient and education, pu public education is not good enough. It's not well funded enough. And there are, um, uh, there is an insufficient level of support uh, for bettering society through science and engineering, okay? And so we need to get the best people interested, and we don't want a good person to not go into science and engineering because they think it's you know, too male-dominated or too white-dominated or too straight-dominated. So we need to be in there mixing things up and diversifying it so other people can follow us and feel at home and feel, and feel comfortable. Um, so that the best people come in to science engineering and, instead of avoiding it. Um, so I think we should acknowledge that the university should acknowledge LGBT people as underrepresented in science engineering, because we are underrepresenting, and we should be uh, the beneficiaries of the recruitment efforts and the support mechanisms. Um, and if this, and if, if this has been made clear in an actual academic study, 
So this is um, the Journal of um, Engineering, um, uh, it's called Engineering Studies. Um, and so this article, I believe these researchers from Northwestern wrote this article, Navigating the Heteronormativity of Engineering, the Experience of, of, of LGBT Students. And so they, they did, um, they used uh, appropriate, you know, uh, sociological methodology, research methodology. And I'll just excerpt one thing, which I think is sort of the take home point from the study. They interviewed a number of LGBT, LGBT students at a large um, engineering school in the US. And they found this, we find that both pervasive prejudicial cultural norms and perceptions of competence, particularly competence to the engineering profession, I think this maps on the science as well. But that, those perceptions can limit these students' opportunities to succeed relative to their heterosexual peers. Nevertheless, through coping strategies, which can require immense amounts of additional emotional and academic effort, LGBT students navigate the chilly and heteronormative engineering climate by passing as heterosexuals, by covering or downplaying cultural characteristics associated with LGBT identities, garnering expertise to, and garnering expertise to make themselves indispensable to others. So ways to protect yourself and to make yourself indispensable. And this resonated when I read it because, you know, this is what I myself had tried to do. I had to prove myself above and beyond my colleagues so that if they marked me down for being gay, I could uh, recover by being an overachiever. So these additional work burdens are often ac accompanied by academic and social is isolation in the engineering school, a hostile place for many LGBT identifying students. I think, that, and I think there's aspects of this that map into the physical sciences uh, as well. Um, I think it's changing, but, I, but this is why uh, it matters. Um, and this was an article um, from about four years ago, October 2010. Science uh, Careers had an article about this, and this was the first one that I know of um, in such a major scientific publication that talked about um, the career paths. So, um, so there's now more awareness, and there's a lot more going on. Uh, at Penn, uh, we have, actually they changed their names. It used to be Quest, Queer Undergraduate Engineers in Science, Engineering, and Technology. They now changed their names to, it's now an OSTEM group, so actually I should have updated this. Um, so that's launched, OSTEM groups have launched across the country uh, and in other countries, and, and you're doing what you're doing. So when I ask you ask what the future is, I look right back at all of you and that this is what the future is. So what I would, you know, think you should, should do and think about, do speak up for science and engineering um, and education more broadly. Um, what we do in science will become harder and harder the, 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 the less appreciation there is of science, of scientific, of scientific method, of scientific thinking. Um, you know, federal funding is, is lacking. Anti-science attitudes are prevalent being taught in science classrooms. Um, and so, so you need to be involved, not just uh, for the sake of you know, LGBT uh, students, um, but also for for the, the future of the planet as a whole. Um, so, so what you're doing matters in so many ways. So do great work, you know, set a great example, and, and encourage others to, to get into STEM and to not uh, be afraid to do it. Um, so thank you for what you're doing, and, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Well, that was great. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could speak either, um, I don't know what your husband does, but either from personal or um, professional experience about navigating the so-called two-body problem as a, as a gay couple. Um, do you find that so, since these are things, my understanding is that these are things worked out by universities, not on um, like a policy yep. basis, but a kind of, um, so do you find that the departments follow the policy or, or yeah, so I think at some places, even in Wisconsin, for, by the time I left Wisconsin, the physics department, um, they hired a gay couple, a gay married couple. It was a two-curve hire. And I think both of them were, were excellent. Both of them were above, above the bar. But they only had one open. So the department went to the provost and said, we can't get this one guy in this area if we don't also hire his husband. 
who is excellent. And the provost said, okay, I will give you the funds. So they hired this gay married couple. Um, at Penn, we have, there has also been a case of trying to, he unsuccessfully tried to recruit a, um, uh, a male, a same-sex uh, couple. Um, and it was treated the same as, uh, you know, as not same-sex couple. But not all universities, so not all universities follow that. So it's, it's school by school. And uh, I think that those kind of policies come about when it takes people on the inside educating uh, the upper administration that you have to do this. It's the right thing to do. It's better. It's the university's interest to do this. So you should have this policy. You should be explicit about this policy. You should get your website that you, you know, will do um, spousal hiring. They have a spousal hiring program uh, for same-sex couples as well as um, you know, opposite-sex couples. But it, it varies by university. Um, so I think if you're on the job market, my my view is this: um, it's a, you need to ask yourself how, uh, before you interview whether or not you are comfortable in, in coming in. And you may be. Um, maybe if you know someone at that school, you know you can talk it over with them and get a sense. Like I said, I made a choice in 2000 in 1999 not to come out um, before uh, while I was interviewing. I know others who do um, make it explicit on their resume. It's an individual choice. Regardless of what you decide to do, once you get an offer, what you need to recognize is that the balance of power has now shifted into your hands. Okay? You have that offer. The, university, the department, the search committee, the chair, if they now don't hire you after selecting you out of those 200, 300 applicants, those six people that were interviewed, they chose you. It is failure if they don't get you. So you now put on, play your strong hand and put all the things on the table that you want, politely, diplomatically, with explanations and justifications, but you know, you put on the table. My wife is um, in this field and I cannot come here or it would be very difficult for me to come here unless there were an opportunity for her, which is just what you know, a husband might say about his wife. Maybe they would say it a little earlier, but usually you don't put it on the table until the offer is coming. And I so you absolutely should do it. Okay, if it's the University of Missouri, they might not respond. Yeah. They probably don't apply there. Any other questions? Um, do you have any sense for how like STEM fields are different from other fields mm -hmm. with respect to LGBT people? Because I know like for like for women and for minorities, like STEM fields are sort of worse yes. than average by yes. a lot. But um, do you have any idea how that breaks down? You know, I think you know the exception is when it comes to women is, is in the biological sciences where there's more women. But there are still issues, no question. I mean, there's sexism everywhere in society, including in the biological sciences and everywhere else. Um, and then, you know, uh, racial minorities are underrepresented uh, quite badly compared to the population um, uh, in, in all STEM fields, pretty much, unfortunately. I think with LGBT, uh, well, with, with lesbian and gay uh, academics, uh, researchers, um, I think there's, there's, first of all, I think there's some underrepresentation numbers. And the ones who are actually out, of course, are even less. So there's, there's certainly a representation of out uh, gay, lesbian, and sort bisexual, transgender um, academics in, in STEM fields. So that's why it helps to um, you know, This is one study, you know, this is, it's, this um, works with my own experience that if nobody's out, then uh, people, the, 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 the uh, homophobic remarks are more likely to be made. Um, the uh, lack of awareness of the need for any discrimination policies are, uh, it's not there. Um, so, uh, so I think the climate can be changed, but it only happens when people work from the inside and from the outside. Um, so, uh, so what am I saying? I'm saying, you're, yes, I think it's, it's a, it, the environment isn't as good as it needs to be, but it can be changed. You, 
you can make a difference. I feel I made a difference. I've seen small numbers of individuals make differences in their own departments as one person coming out and changing the, just opening the minds of a whole bunch of people. Um, and it's not horrible. Here's the, the saving grace of it all. If you are successful, they don't care if you have three heads. If you're bringing in outside grants, you know, that's ultimately what matters. So that what I, is what I felt sort of work to work to my advantage and other people's advantage. You know, people will put aside, most rational people will put aside, even if they're comfortable with some sexuality. If, if you're a productive, uh, collegial um, member who's, who teaches well, who works hard, who tries hard, who's bringing in funding, who's publishing, who's bringing notoriety and prestige to the university, fine. You know, you can have three heads that dress badly. And, well, we wouldn't dress badly. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean. So you mentioned that there's kind of, it's still kind of a debate whether LGBT people should be recognized as underrepresented in a lot of these areas. Yeah. Where do you see the, where do you see that falling in the future? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I honestly don't know because um, it's, I haven't seen uh, other universities, any universities in the U.S. yet, uh, take a clear stance saying, yes, we are going to explicitly you know, state that LGBT uh, faculty are to be you know, explicitly recruited. Although I, I may not be up to date. I haven't looked closely in the last two, couple of years. Um, it's fraught because we want to be careful not to take away. We're not asking for a piece of someone else's pie. You know, we're, we, we agree and our allies would, you know, I think should be allies with with, um, with women and with, with um, racial and ethnic minorities who, you know, I want to see more diverse science because I want to see the best people regardless of background come in and succeed. Um, so so there's, a, there's, a, there's a risk that if, if you know, uh, LGBT faculty start saying, well, we want to be counted as minority as well, that that could set up a, a battle uh, unintentionally um, with, with others. But it's not about divvying up the same high and small number of pieces. It's about saying we need even more resources to be directed towards this. So I think if you form alliances um, and say you know, we're all better off, we have a, a diverse um, faculty and student body that feels welcome and the climate is there, um, that that's better for the institution. But it's tough because how do you know someone's gay? Uh, what if they what if they're gay but they don't want to say? Are you going to force them to come out? You're will you're willing to will tell you to benefit, but only if you come out. You know we can't you can't put that on the line. But if they're not going to come out, you can't count them. So the numbers aren't really there. The data isn't really there. So it, it's it's not as straightforward an issue to deal with as race or gender is. Um, so I think that we're entering an era where most people who want to come out can come out. Many many more can come out than in the past. So this issue of forcing people. And so it becomes easier to then say, okay, those who self-identify, those who choose to self-identify as LGBT, we will, um, we will count them as enhancing the diversity of the university, and that's one of our goals. But it's it's still a tough sell. So, um, well, to add to this question, on APS, the Physics Society, they have a meeting in 2012, which was the first meeting where they talked about LGBT issues. And the main issue that they found was that there's no data whatsoever yeah. to identify if LGBT are a minority or not in science, right? Because most researchers, they choose not to talk about their personal life in their professional environment. That's um, so as we progress, uh, I mean, they have, this was the first meeting and they have a meeting every year. Um, one of the things that they asked in APS to do is to create an LGBT section uh, a national LGBT association from the physics community where they could do surveys and like identify whether uh, LGBT are or not a minority in the, uh, the physical sciences. So hopefully data will come out in the next few years. Yeah. yeah. Eric? Yeah, so you've mentioned a couple times that what needs to happen probably is that the culture is changed 
both inside and outside of departments. So as a student group, how do you think we can sort of catalyze that change? I, you know, you, you all may have better ideas than I do, uh, but I think that by, by having this organization, by being very open about it, by plastering your posters for this talk all over the building, <laughs> which I saw more for this, set, for this seminar than for my <laughs> um, um by being out to your advisors and your colleagues and your professors, and there's you know, or, or being out and being, and that includes being out as an ally, um, which I think coming out as an ally is a wonderful thing, and that helps. And um, uh, and talking about it and letting people know. I mean, if, for example, I started sharing this study with my colleagues in engineering, and you know, it's great colleagues who say, "Wow, I didn't think about this." So I, I have a new, and they read this and they see they have a new appreciation for the climate issues. So. Share this or the other things, or you know, uh, you put things on your Facebook, you put things uh, in what you're tweeting, whatever, and maybe other your classmates, your faculty, your TAs, they, they hear these things. So just being open about it, talking about it, bringing it up, just the reality of there's LGBT people here and they want to just get their work done in a positive, supportive climate that isn't harmful. That's a very powerful argument, and that scientists can. Look, yeah, we all want to get the best people. So you have a powerful argument um, behind you for making the climate and the mechanisms and the resources equally, you know, equally good for everybody. Um, so, but you probably have you, you, you probably have more ideas. What do you think you should do? What do you guys think? You or anybody? What do you want to do? What do you, what is your group? So, so visibility is, is a large issue for us, and, yeah. and this kind of program is directed towards that aim. Yeah. Um, we also think that uh, there's, there's a, a leaky pipeline, and we yes. lose LGBT at some point. We think it's most likely in high school. Yeah. Um, we're not, that's speculation, but um, for, for that, we, we want to do some mentoring of high school students and outreach to high school students with, with some sort of LGBT component to it. Um, we want to provide social support, we want to provide professional support. Uh, so we're doing all sorts of things. That's great. I think that's a wonderful idea about the high school outreach. Any other questions? No. Well, this, thanks to the speaker again. Thank you to the department as well for uh, allowing us to have these meetings and also to allow us to have this organization and the department. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs>